special. And I, I uh, really appreciate being asked to deliver a message this morning. It's always special uh, when I come back to Columbus and act the way I'm supposed to. <clears throat> You're a hypocrite. You ever been told that? Um, you tell me if this syllogism holds true. All Christians believe that uh, they should not commit sin and to profess one thing and live another way is hypocrisy. That's one leg. The other leg is all Christians commit sin. The ending to that is all Christians are hypocrites, therefore. Does that hold true? If not, why not? Is it, if it's fallacious reasoning, then where's the, the problem with it? That's what we want to look into a little bit today. Um, have you ever heard a lesson strictly on hypocrisy? I, I can't remember if I have, but I've, I've been doing a series of studies uh, on Wednesday night. I think, um, I think Heath Rogers is the author of the book, Overcoming Sin. And so I'm adapting one of those lessons into a sermon. This took me four or five weeks to do, so I figure we'll be out of here by four or five o'clock this evening <laughs> if, I, if I really condense this. No, I won't keep you here that long. And if you're here visiting today because it's Easter, I'm sorry I don't have an Easter sermon for you. We just had the Easter sermon. And you come back next week and we'll have it again. And that is remembering the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection and the memorial supper that he's left. And if you'd like to talk more about that, we would love to talk to you and uh, explain to you why we do. I'm visiting here, so don't, don't judge this group by me by any means, but uh, everyone here would love to talk to you more about that. Okay, so <clears throat> let's think about this idea of being a hypocrite. Um, here's, the, here's the Greek word. I don't know Greek. My, my father-in-law taught first, second, and third year Greek at Florida College, and every time I bring it up, he tells me how I mispronounce it, and I don't get all the meaning in there. And, and he's in the audience now when I preach, so it's, uh, it's not much fun. But anyway, he's trying to, he's trying to learn me. <clears throat> uh, the, the, here's the Greek word. It's hupokrites. And it means an actor under an assumed character. That's what Strong says about it. Or a dissembler. Have you ever used the word dissembler in a sentence? Because I haven't. I had to look it up. <clears throat> Vine says, a stage actor. It was custom for Greek and Roman actors to speak in large mass with mechanical devices for augmenting the force of the voice. Then, you know, by metonymy, it becomes uh, the idea of one who is a hypocrite, one who puts on the mask and there's something different. So here's what a dissembler is, if you're like me and you didn't know. Someone who hides their real feelings or attention, intentions or hides the true facts. This is the idea of putting on the mask. You know, you're something, everyone else sees the mask, but what you are is underneath the mask. And so that's the idea of being a hypocrite. Here's some examples. So-and-so is a master dissembler and is prone to make disingenuous comments at times such as these, comments designed to deflect any suspicions that he may have had a role in this decision. So who he is is underneath. What you see uh, is something totally different. That's the idea of being a hypocrite. Now, when you look at the hypocrite in the, in the Bible, it surprised me that the word hypocrite, now maybe you already know this, I didn't. It's only used in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it is only spoken by Jesus Christ. Did you know that? I didn't. You guys aren't saying yes or no. Are you awake? <laughs> okay. Um, it is used one other time in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 13, but it's a different word. You can see in that the original word we were looking at, but it's a little bit different. And by the, by the way, that word starts with H-U-P-O. When we anglicize that, that's H-Y-P-O, hypo, 
And what does that mean? Under, hypodermic, under the skin. So this is the person under the mask. Then hypocrisy is used several times uh, throughout the New Testament. And so uh, this is spoken um, both by people that are Christians and, and are not. William Barclay makes the observation in the New Testament there is no sin more strongly condemned than hypocrisy. And in popular opinion there is no sin more universally detested. How do you feel about someone that's a hypocrite? Don't have a lot of respect for them, do you? Somebody tells you one thing and then they, they go act a different way. You don't have a lot of respect for that. Now we're going to talk about uh, why that is and some things that the Bible says is the problem. What's the problem with hypocrisy? Is it really that bad? Well, let's think about some things. Number one, hypocrisy, when you boil it down, is really just a form of lying, isn't it? Because... You're saying one thing is true, in reality it's not. That's, that's lying, isn't it? And so that's what hypocrisy is. Uh, the, the whole purpose behind playing the hypocrite is to make other people believe something about us that's not true, and that's a lie. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 6 and verses 16 through 19, it's interesting to me that in, in the course of those four verses... Lying is mentioned twice. Now, the, these are those uh, things that God hates. Well, if He hates lying, all, you only have to say it once, right? But, he, but the wise man says it twice. He hates a lying tongue in verse 7. And then in verse 19, he says he hates a false witness who speaks lies. Do you know how God feels about lying? He makes it pretty plain, doesn't He? Well, lying and hand in hand... Uh, lying and, and uh, hypocrisy go hand in hand. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, can you still see this up there? Is it still? All right, good. I like to do this. Some places it doesn't work. But here's uh, 1 Timothy 4. The Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy. When I, when I presented this as a Bible class, I had someone take issue with me, and they said, I don't think hypocrisy is lying. I just, I don't think that's the motive behind it. And so when we got to this verse, I said, well, what, what do you think about this verse speaking lies in hypocrisy? He said, what's the next point? He didn't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> lies and hypocrisy go, go hand in hand. They're, they're, hypocrisy is all about lying, and, we're, and we'll talk about the motivation behind it in just a moment. But when, when, the, when the serpent came out with Adam and Eve, God said, you'll surely die. The serpent said, you shall not surely die. And this really boils down to being, playing something that you're not. I, I'm out here for your good. Well, in reality, Satan was not. And so the hypocrite, as the wise man said in Proverbs 11, with his mouth, destroys his neighbor. And uh, Satan destroyed uh, the influence of mankind at that point. Okay, what's wrong with... Uh, and, and I can't go through all these verses, so if you want, we'll run these off or something, and you, you guys can go through them all later. <clears throat> the problem with hypocrisy, it taints true love. First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, I want you to be thinking about this as we go through this point. The purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. Okay, you ha have those terms in your mind? Pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith. Okay, hypocrisy destroys that. Love is supposed to come from good, pure, honorable motives. Uh, in fact, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 9, it's amazing when you start looking at this idea how much is said about how things go hand in hand. And Paul simply says in Romans 12 and verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. I remember in high school, you know, there'd be people that you'd see them in the hall and they'd say, hey man, how you doing? It's good to see you. And as you're walking away, you're going, man, I really can't stand that guy. 
That's not right, is it? That's not real love. And when push comes to shove, that will, that will come out, won't it? If you don't really love someone, you won't really be there for them. So love is the greatest virtue that a Christian possesses, but hypocrisy is such, of such a nature it can destroy all the good that could be done out of love. Our love for others has to be sincere and fervent, otherwise it taints this true love and we lose our influence. Yesterday we were handing out Bibles over uh, at the Dollar General and there were some people that came up and the reason they stayed is because we paid attention to them. We showed some interest in them. Now, if we just feigned that, and then if they came to church here and we just kind of ignored them, you think we're going to have much of an influence on people like that? No, because we don't really love them if we're, all we want to do is get them in the door. That's not true love. And so hypocrisy taints true love. What, what did Jesus say? By this shall all the world know that you're my disciples. If you have a great speaking voice. Is that what he said? If you are, by this shall all the world know that you're my disciples. If you have a in huge uh, knowledge of my word. Is that what he said? No, he said, all the world will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. But if the world sees some kind of hypocritical, surface, lying kind of love, then, then we're not his disciples. We don't have that great influence anymore. That's what's wrong with hypocrisy. Now, you want to see the real thing. When you see that picture, does it bring anything to your mind? Jesus was in Bethany. Mary broke a flask of very costly oil, and she began to anoint Jesus with it. Now, at that time, there was another fellow there, and he, he knew the value of that, and he said, why wasn't this sold? We, it would make a great profit, and so many more people could have been helped. Now, let me ask you, would that be a good thing to do with the oil that Mary had? Yes, it would. It would be. So if a guy suggests that, that's an honorable, that's a noble thing for him to suggest, right? It would be if he were genuine. But we know that he wasn't. He said this, why? Just to fill the purse up a little more, the same one that he was dipping his hands into. And so here is really true love and hypocritical love contrasted. And it all happens at the same event. Now, which one am I displaying? The same thing happens with Judas when it's time for Jesus to be arrested in the garden. And he gave a sign that the one that I kiss, well, would it normally be good and, and, and uh, something to be expected for a disciple of Jesus to come and greet him with a kiss? Yes. I'm sure it happened over and over, and it would normally be a good thing. But in this case, it is not because it is not genuine. It's a hypocritical kiss. He had told them, whoever I kiss, he's the one, sees him. And Jesus points out the hypocrisy of his kiss. He said, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? You're not greeting me affectionately. You are betraying me. You're making it look like on the outside what you would do as a faithful disciple, but inwardly you are completely betraying everything that we have. That's the role of the hypocrite. Why is hypocrisy a problem? It does great harm to the cause of Christ. Some, sometimes people criticize the Lord's church they say it's full of hypocrites. Well, of course it's full of hypocrites. Where else would hypocrites be? I mean, you don't find hypocrites out here saying the people that don't believe anything. How can they be hypocrites? Of course hypocrites are in the church. There's no place else for them to be. As long as there's a church, there will be hypocrites in it. Because people are people. This, As we talked about in class this morning, it's not the ideal that Jesus had for the church, 
But people are free to be hypocrites, and the devil tempts them to be hypocrites, and so that's going to keep happening. Um, the failure of God's people to practice uh, what, we're, what we're preaching, that doesn't prove uh, that, uh, you know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't believe in God because there's hypocrisy in the church. Uh, in uh, Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 21, Romans 2 and verse 21. <clears throat> you therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? Now what would you call that person if they, they told their neighbor, now I'm a Christian, I don't, I don't think it's right to steal. And one night the, the light comes on, you know, the motion light comes on, and the guy comes out, and you're out there in his shed with the doors open. Oh, what do you think that guy thinks about you? you? You told me it's wrong to steal. What are you doing? That's what the Apostle Paul says. You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? That's hypocrisy demonstrated. And we do great harm to the cause of Christ when we do this, people then can point and say, I don't want anything. to." I've had people say to me when I invite them to church, I know who goes to church with you. And I know that I'm living a better life than they are. And you know what's sad? I can't disagree with them. Of course, them living a better life than the person that I go to church with is not going to get them to heaven, is it? That's not, that's not what it's about. It's being a disciple of Jesus. Elevating Jesus. Mahatma Gandhi said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Boy, that is pitiful, isn't it? But you know what's a shame? Many times it's true. We call ourselves Christians. Anything with that suffix I-A-N-S, what does it mean? It means basically one of, right? One of Christ. I'm a disciple of Christ. Would it surprise people? Let's say you've been going to the same market for years and years and you just kind of casually know the cashier there. And you've been going there for five or six years and, and the preacher talks about we need to start inviting people to services and things. And so it lights a fire under you and this time you go to the market and, and you say, by the way, I, I go to church up on 25th Street, the brethren that meet there, and I wanted to invite you to come and be with us. Would the person be shocked? You're a Christian? You go to church? I've seen how you treat people, you know, in, in the store. I've heard the kind of language you use. I had no idea you were a Christian. Would they be shocked? That's the charge that's made here. And we do such harm to the cause of Christ. Matthew chapter 18, verses 6 and 7. Jesus says, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Have you ever stopped just to picture that? Can you imagine being pulled down in the water swimming as hard as you could against the weight, and there's no way for you to overcome that weight. That's a horrible way to die, isn't it? Did you know Jesus said it's a good way to die if you are a hypocrite? It, it's better than being a hypocrite. That's pretty strong language. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom... They come. Am I causing people not to come and hear the gospel at 25th Street because of the way I live my life? Jesus says, uh, better not do it. Hypocrisy is contagious. That's what's wrong with it. Not only does the hypocritical Christian have a negative influence upon unbelievers, he or she has a negative influence upon his, his or her brethren like many other sins. Hypocrisy is highly contagious. We're worried about COVID. Quit worrying about COVID. Start worrying about hypocrisy. It does much more damage. Paul's, 
Paul says that Peter acted like a hypocrite. You remember this? Galatians chapter 2, we'll probably come back to this again, but in Galatians 2 and verse 11, Paul says, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face. What? He was one of the original 12. And you're talking bad to him? Yes. Why? Because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came... He withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Man, you go back to Acts chapter 4 and see all these people coming and laying down their gifts at the apostles' feet because Christians need taken care of. And Barnabas is mentioned as one of those people. You know, it's the next chapter. Those guys we don't like, but Barnabas, yeah. And Peter had a negative effect on Barnabas. There was a guy that lived across the street from me when I was growing up, and he, he, everything he did just seemed to turn out good, you know, and I just thought, oh, man, he, he's, he's all that. And, uh, you know, we would hang around. There was a lot of kids in the neighborhood. We all played together and, and all these things. But one day, you know, he was, he was a year ahead of me in school. And one day I saw him at uh, North, and I said, hey, Mark. And he was with a bunch of his gymnast buddies. Never even looked. I was completely invisible. Just walked right on by. I was like, you got to be kidding me. I live like 50 feet away from you. Hello? Why did he do that? He didn't want to show to his buddies that he was friends with someone that was younger you know, wasn't in their class. And so then when we get home, I said, well, hey, what happened today? Oh, no big deal. Come on, let's go do something. That, that's just not going to work, is it? That's not going to work for me. And that's the power that Peter had in his influence. It's contagious. When, if an apostle says, you know, if, a, if a, a, a preacher that you really respect... If he says, oh, you know, it's okay to drink a little beer now and then. You say, oh, I thought it was wrong. But that preacher said, well, I guess it must be all right. It's not all right. I was interviewed by the third, fourth, and fifth graders Wednesday night. Uh, they wrote their questions, and then they brought me in and interviewed me. And uh, one of the things that they wanted to know is, do you get nervous when you preach? Now, I've been preaching for like 45 years. And uh, do you get nervous when you preach? I said, yes, I do. You can ask Deanne. It, it, she, every Sunday morning, my stomach is in knots. She, you know, she finds me in the restroom. I'm all upset. And still, they said, why would you still get nervous? I said, because what I'm talking about is the most important thing in the world. And secondly, if I say it, there's a bunch of people that are going to believe it without even cracking this thing. They're going to say, well, he said it. He studies all the time. That's all he does. It must be right. Well, guess what? I make mistakes. I make mistakes. And you're supposed to check me. I love these prayers. You, do you still pray this, Jim? This was prayed a lot when I was growing up. Uh, be with the speaker. Let him have a ready remembrance of the things that he's prepared. And let us compare them to the Scriptures, and finding them to be true, let us apply them to our lives. I used to hear that all the time, and I thought it was just something you said. It's not. You are supposed to compare them to the Scriptures and find them to be true or false. You know, I, I, I grew up hearing a lot of people say that every reference in the New Testament to the church has to do with Jesus Christ. And when we got to the one about to the church of the firstborn, people say, you see there, he's a, the Bible says he's the firstborn from the dead. That's not what that means. Guess what? The word firstborn is plural. And I'd been preaching it like that for six, seven, eight years, and somebody came to me and said, firstborn is plural. How could that be Jesus? I said, you got to be kidding me. It, is, it really is. And I studied it, and it refers to the people who are a part of the church. And that whole doctrine of every reference is to Christ went out the window. I was wrong. 
And I corrected it. And I don't say that anymore. In fact, some translations say, to the church of the firstborn ones. And that clears that right up, doesn't it? You check that out and see. But if the preacher says it, does that mean it's all right? No, check it out. Peter was wrong, but he influenced Barnabas. What's wrong with hypocrisy? The hypocrite's going to be destroyed. <clears throat> Notice uh, that hypocrisy is like all other sins. Jesus says sin sends us to hell. In one parable, Jesus taught that an evil servant would be cut in two and appointed a portion with the hypocrites. Matthew chapter 25. Hypocrisy is a form of lying. We've already, we've already discovered that uh, in Revelation 21 and verse 8. Notice there in that big long list of people that will be thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. What does it end with? And all liars. I think we've proven, if I, if I haven't proven that, then get with me and I will prove it, that if you're a hypocrite, you are a liar because you're saying something outside that's not true on the inside, and that's lying. And liars, Jesus says, are condemned. John tells us in Revelation where they will end up. Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5, remember them? They, you know, there was Barnabas at the end of Acts 4. He brought his stuff, laid it down at the feet of the apostles, and said, there's, there's Christians that need to be taken care of here. Here's all my money, take it and divide it up as anybody needs it. Ananias and Sapphira saw that everybody was doing that, and Ananias said, all right, Sapphira, here's what we're going to do. We're going to sell it for $5,000, we're going to give them $3,000, we're going to put $2,000 in our pocket, and we're going to act like we sold it for $3,000, all right? Okay. And that's what they did. They made it look like they were giving all like the others, but they held back part of the price. What do you call that? You make it look one way, and in reality it's something else. It's hypocrisy. And Peter defined it as lying. He said you're lying to God. He said you're lying to the Holy Spirit. And so the hypocrite will be destroyed. Ananias and Sapphira, it was instant. But if it's not instant... John says it will happen in the end. Well, here is the good news that if I'm guilty of hypocrisy, the Bible also tells me how to overcome that, as it does every sin. And so we want to think about that. And the key to overcoming any sin is what? Repent. What does it mean to repent? About face. Go the opposite direction. Stop serving the devil, start serving the Lord the way you're supposed to, that your sins may be wiped out, like hypocrisy. We all understand, I think, the idea of repentance. I think the military gives us the best thing. My, my dad used to show me how they taught him to march in the National Guard, and he was very precise in how he put his foot here and whipped around. And that he said that's what they expected. It had to be, you know, crisp and precise and you turned exactly 180 degrees that's the way they expected it every time well guess what that's what God expects John chapter 12 and verse 4 John 12 and verse 4 one of his disciples Judas Iscariot Simon's son who who would betray him said why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor this he said not that he cared for the poor, but that he was a thief. What would Judas have to do to stop being a hypocrite? He'd have to stop being, trying to be something on the outside that he wasn't on the inside, right? He would have to mean from his heart genuinely, we should sell this and help poor people, right? That is a change in mind, change in attitude, change in motivation. It's a complete change. And that's what the Bible says we need to do. Acts chapter 8, Simon the sorcerer. Do you think Simon the sorcerer genuinely became a Christian? You know, some people don't. 
Some people I talk to, they say he never did become a Christian. The description of Simon in Acts chapter 8 is no different than any of the people of Samaria. If any of the people of Samaria became Christians, then Simon did too. And so he did. But then immediately he committed sin. Well, that makes him a hypocrite, right? No. Because our syllogism at the beginning, it's fallacious reasoning. That doesn't work, by the way. He committed sin, and what was he told to do about it? Repent and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. That's the key to overcoming hypocrisy, as it is with every sin. Stop seeking the praise of men. Do you understand that's why we are hypocrites? Because we're concerned about what people think. Why did Mark Brock... Oh, sorry, it's going to be on the internet. Why did that guy I talked about earlier... Uh, why did he ignore me in the hallway? Because he was concerned about what people thought, not about what God thought. And that's why we're hypocrites. Because we're concerned about what people think. Stop doing that. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. Matthew 6, 24. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you also. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. You stop thinking about what people think about you and be interested in what God thinks. Seek forgiveness from God. Uh, remember in James chapter 4 and in verse 4 what happened there? Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We would stop being hypocrites if we stopped worrying about what other people think. And you know what's ridiculous? Is anybody here in high school getting ready to graduate? Anybody in that age group? You're all older than that, right? Well, anyway, I'll share this with you anyway. You know, when I was in high school, I was so concerned about what people thought. You know, I wanted to be in, in this crowd. I was concerned, you know, what they thought. I, I didn't want to wear my pants too high because they could make fun of me. I didn't want to wear them too long. Or what. what was funny was the day after graduation, I could care less what they think. So why was I so concerned for a few years in high school? I hope that could help somebody. Because let me tell you, I lived past high school and it doesn't matter what they think. And we will stop being hypocrites when we stop putting so much credence in what people think of us and ask, what does God think about me? We need to practice what we preach. I love this. If you think your daily inspirational quotes make people believe you're someone you're not, you are sadly mistaken. I know a lot of people that put a lot of neat stuff on, you know, and I think, wow, that's really good. And then come to find out they live a totally different way. This is a, this is a, a, t a play on words. People are not always what they post to be. Is that not true? What was Peter what he post to be? <laughs> he wasn't what he post to be. And, and we need to be those people practice what we preach. That's the problem with hypocrisy. It's great about preaching. It falls short in practicing. And so uh, you think about uh, Matthew chapter 23 and verse 3, the words of our Lord. Jesus says, Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? They were not being what they were supposed to be. He got on to the Pharisees over and over for this. We can overcome hypocrisy by judging with righteous judgment. Did you know everybody knows Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2? Everybody! Atheists know it. Uh, people who have fallen away from the Lord's church know it. People in denominations, people that make no claim to religion at all. Everybody knows Matthew 7, 1 and 2. Don't judge me. Judge not. That's what the Bible says. But did you know it goes on to say, judge righteous judgment? That tells you that not all judging is outlawed. But when you do judge, judge the right way. 
Make sure you have all the facts. John chapter 7 and verse 21. Notice there. Jesus said, I did one work and you all marvel. Moses gave you circumcision and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Now, if it just, you know, you're supposed to be circumcised eight days after you're born, and if that eighth day just happened to fall on Saturday, you're not supposed to do any work, but they say, yeah, but the law says you've got to be circumcised, so that's got to be an exception, so let's circumcise this guy. And there comes Jesus and says, I'm going to miraculously heal somebody. Wait a minute, you can't do that on the Sabbath. I can't change someone's life forever. I can't restore them miraculously in a way that no one else can. I can't demonstrate that I'm truly the Son of God because it's Saturday, but you're going to keep the law of Moses? That's not judging righteous judgment. And can you imagine, if you were there, would you be influenced by the Pharisees? I wouldn't. We have to judge the right way. And we need to tell and live the truth. If we do this we are going to have an influence and an impact on the world. Uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11, I know you're familiar with this passage, but can't be overemphasized. Where Paul says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content, tell and live the truth. I go and visit a fellow twice a week who's in jail, and we have Bible studies. And he read a book while he was in jail. I won't be able to remember the name of it right now, but the author's name is Barrow, B-A-R-R-O-W. And it's available there to all the people in jail. And what the book says is the reason all, all of us are getting in trouble and thrown in jail is we're not content. If we realize that just having our freedom and just living at home and being able to eat anytime we want and having our family around us and all of it, if we realized that that's all that life was about, we wouldn't be in jail. We wouldn't have to add drunk driving to that beautiful life. We wouldn't have to, have, we wouldn't have to add domestic violence to that because we already have a beautiful life. We wouldn't have to add all these sinful things. We would be content knowing that what we have is everything that we need. Paul said, I've learned that. And what that book says is, if we would learn that, we wouldn't get thrown in jail. We wouldn't be trying to add these other things. We need to uh, add what is important to our lives, leave the rest of that alone. If we have a problem with hypocrisy, we need to stop lying through both our words and our actions. And like Paul we are to live openly and honestly with all men. He says that in 2 Corinthians 8. Learn to be content. Stop giving in to the temptation to have others believe that we are something we are not. I hope these things will be of value to you. They, they have been of great value to me. Uh, they've, they've helped me to learn what's important from the Bible. And most of all, this is one of the greatest things about the Bible, is it tells you not just what sin, but how to overcome it. Every sin in there tells us how to overcome it. And so if hypocrisy has been a problem with you, it was for me. When I was young, hypocrisy was a problem. And a lot of young people I talk to now, it's a problem because they want people to think something. You know what? That doesn't stop when you get older. Are there people in the business world that want you to think that there's something that they're not? <laughs> oh, you better believe it. But God says don't do it. And stop worrying about what people think about you. You worry about what I think about you and everything else will fall into place. If there's a way that we can help you, if you need to become Christ's child by confessing your faith in Jesus as the Son of God, repenting and being baptized in His name for the forgiveness of sins, Everything's ready that we can do that. I was talking to somebody last night that told me they were the first person in this building that asked to be baptized, and they had to take them over to 10th Street because the thing wasn't ready. Well, it's ready now. And if you need to obey the gospel, we'll do it right now. We'll help you in that. And if you're a Christian and your life is not ready to meet God, 
then we'll help you with that too. We'll pray with you. We'll encourage you. We'll hold your hands up. If we can help you at all, come up to the front and let us know right now while we stand and sing.